Okay, uh, we have uh, one section left to get through. Um, and then uh, any other time will be spent either on homework questions or the uh, practice final. So does anyone have any homework questions? Because 15.5 is due tonight. At least that one didn't have any integrals involved. So no questions about that one? If you have any later, um, I can need to take it up and uh, let me know because we're good enough shape time-wise for that. Okay, so ideally maybe we'll get through this last section today and then we'll have all of Wednesday and Friday for review. Um, because of course there are a lot of, there are more problems to talk about uh, this time. Um, and remember finals Thursday, the last day of finals week at 10.45. All right, so we've had a number of theorems that relate integrals over a uh, lower dimensional entity, uh, like a curve, to a higher dimensional entity a surface. Um, and this is going to go one step further. So this is, Stokes' theorem is one way to generalize Green's theorem from 2D to 3D, and uh, this is another. Um, so, um, I mean, different ways of writing Green's theorem. Um, this is one that we haven't really needed in problems, but it helps generalize to 3D. Um, that if you have a vector field, uh, F. And instead of taking a dot product with the tangent vector like we normally do, we take the dot product with the normal vector. So this is the uh, this is a flux of F rather than the um, circulation. Then that turned out to be equal to the integral over the interior. Uh, so this is the same old situation we've had for a while now with the closed curve C counterclockwise, and D is the interior, of the divergence of F. Uh, okay. And if, um, if F is equal to two, typical two-dimensional vector field uh, PQ, then uh, what that meant was uh, so the integral over V um, curve C turn out to be uh, PDY minus QDX is what because normally with line integrals we have PDX plus QDY but that's when it's dot tangent vector so dot with normal vector it's this um, and the divergence is Px plus Qy. Okay. Okay. Um, so this is an equivalent form of Green's theorem. Um, so now if we generalize this to 3D. Right, so all of this is. Green's theorem, but written into per divergence form. Okay. Um, so the um, the uh, divergence theorem, which is sometimes called the Gauss divergence theorem, okay, is a three D version of this that says that. Um, the integral over a closed surface of a vector field F. And for a surface integral, we take the dot product with the normal vector. So that's how we always do our surface integrals. So this part is, isn't any different. Uh, but I have to point out that this is the outward normal, because when you have a surface, 
It has a normal vector defined in the whole surface, and it can be pointing either this way or this way in, in opposite directions. So you can choose outward or inward. We need outward for this theorem to be correct. So, so the integral of your vector field f over this closed surface is equal to a triple integral over a solid that is the interior of s, of the divergence of f. This is what the divergence theorem says. Um, so if the task is to evaluate this uh, integral of this vector field over some closed surface, for instance, a sphere, uh, then we can use a divergence theorem to rewrite this as an integral over the ball inside, or the interior of that sphere. And since we're, the divergence involves taking derivatives of the components of f, um, often this integrand can be simpler to work with. Like, for instance, what if a divergence is zero? Then you're done. Um, so this is the last of the theorems that we have to express one integral as another uh, by taking some derivatives of whatever components you have in your uh, vector field. OK. Um, all right. So when. Uh, as far as interpretation, um, and that is, if f refers to the velocity field then um, this uh, surface integral That we're trying to evaluate is, uh, refer is referred to as flux. Um, so it's um, so, so so flux refers to the amount of fluid that is passing through the uh, surface. Um, so now we have, um, and it's important that we take the dot product of normal because that indicates, for instance, if the fluid is heading directly towards the surface, then the amount of fluid coming through is going to be larger, whereas if it's like skimming along the surface, not much is going to pass through, so the value of the flux would be small. Um, so now we have another way of computing flux um, in terms of this integral over the interior. All right. Um, so now I have um, some examples of how we can use the divergence theorem. And like Green's theorem, we can go both ways. I remember the task is to evaluate uh, this integral, and you rewrite it this one to make it easier, or vice versa. Okay. So, oh, thank you. Um, so let's suppose our vector field F is no, x squared z cubed, um, 2xy z cubed, and xz to the fourth. Okay. And the surface S is the box um, and it has vertices. Um, x is plus or minus 1, y is plus or minus 2, z is plus or minus 3. So if I want to express this, um, uh, okay, so, so really the interior of a box that's a set of all x, y, and z such that x is between minus 1 and 1, y is between minus 2 and 2, z is between minus 3 and 3. All right. Um, so, so the problem is, okay. 
to evaluate um, the surface integral of f over the surface. Um, so if this was a velocity field, this would be the uh, flux. Okay. Now, um, so it's important to keep in mind, and this, you know, for the final, also, um, whatever integrals you need to evaluate, are you better off evaluating it directly, or do you want to use one of the theorems to perhaps make it easier? Um, in some cases, a problem will say, you know, use the divergence theorem, or use Stokes theorem, or use Green's theorem for this. Um, but not necessarily. Um, in that case, you have a choice. But if you want to evaluate this directly, like come up with parametric equations for S, like we've done in many examples, and uh, you know, figure out your normal vector and so forth, this will take you forever in this example because um, if I have a box, so this is a closed box, all sides, so I have to break this integral up into how many separate integrals? If it's a box, a closed box, how many pieces was that going to have? Yes, six integrals. Um, we don't have that kind of time. Um, so, um, so instead, you use a divergence theorem. to evaluate um, this integral instead. Because then it's just one integral. Also, while it's a triple integral, you might think, oh, that might make it harder. But your limits are already given to you. So let's fill in some particulars. So the integral from uh, minus 3 to 3 and z, minus 2 to 2 and y, minus 1 to 1 and x. And then in divergence of f, um, here are your components, p, q, and r. So you take the derivative of your first component, p, which is x squared z cubed, with respect to x, and then uh, next component, uh, 2x, y, z cubed. So the y component is differentiated with respect to y, and then the z component is differentiated with respect to z, dx, dy, dz. Okay. Um, so now, um, so now we can go ahead and take these partial derivatives. So, so this is the divergence of that vector field there. So if we go ahead and compute these these partial derivatives with respect to x, y, or z respectively, what are we going to get? Yeah, z cubed plus 2x dz cubed. 4z to the third x. Yeah, 4x dz cubed. Well, didn't that work out conveniently? That's what I get for picking problems out of textbooks. Not your textbook, but a different one. Um, yeah, all the terms, they're like terms. You can combine them. Um, so we get 3 minus 2 to 2 minus 2 to 1 of 8xz cubed dv. Uh, well, we have, I'm sorry, I'll write as with the limits involved, dx, dy, dz. And uh, since we have a product here, and that all the limits are constant, you can separate this into, so minus 3 to 3, Oh, pull the 8 out. z cubed dz minus 1 to 1 x dx and then minus 2 to 2 of 1 dy. Um, okay, so this equals this. Okay. Now, um, what is the fastest way to wrap up this problem? I mean, go ahead and evaluate the integrals, but it turns out we don't have to. Why? Cancel in what way? Yeah, yes, it is. In fact, the second one's also going to be zero. Why? Because it's from one negative one. Yes, 
and because it's an odd power. That's the key. Both of these, z cubed and x, are odd functions. Um, so there's some these too. Either one of these would do it and it would make this whole thing zero. Um, if we had, this one would turn out to be non-zero. It's the even power of x. So if f is even, an integral over a symmetric interval, so the limits are negatives of each other, is zero. Oh, sorry, that's not right. If f is odd, that happens. Okay, now I'm going to hopelessly confuse you. If f is even, so odd powers of x, so x, x cubed, x to the fifth, and so on. Whereas f is even, you have 1, x squared, x to the fourth, etc. Uh, also, sine and cosine, because you may remember from Cal 3, um, the Taylor series for sine had all odd powers of x. The Taylor series for cosine had all even powers of x. So in that case, you can't say it's zero. All right, now that I've told you it's not zero, can you remember what does happen here? It's because of this. F has a symmetry to it. Yeah, double of what? Just zero. Zero to A, yes. Okay. And yeah, it doesn't I mean, the anti differentiation is exactly the same, so that you, so it might not really save you anything, except I still recommend it because here you save yourself uh, possibility of making a sign mistake. Okay, um, so um, right, so the integral itself turned out to be rather anticlimactic, but the point was you can get a much easier integral using a divergence theorem in this case. You only have one integral, you don't want to break it up into six. Um, and um, even if these were you know, even powers of x, you still have to work through it. At least um, it, it's, it's a convenience compared to having to Call parametric equations, compute normal vectors, dot product, etc. So, any questions about the use of the divergence theorem in this case? And it's only useful for a closed surface S like this box uh, because you have to have a viable interior to it. So, it can't be like some service patch, like, uh, like I described as a lazy potato chip. There's no interior to that. Okay. <clears throat> Um, now, I have another example where the divergence theorem is used a little more indirectly. So, you know, I said you need an interior. Um, here's a situation where you can use the divergence theorem to help you evaluate integral on a non closed surface where, in order to, for it to make sense, you add another piece to it to make it a closed surface. I took attendance before class started, so I don't need, I'm not forgetting this time. Okay. All right, so for this next example, all right, so our vector field F is d squared x, one third y cubed plus tangent z, and then x squared z plus y squared. Okay. Um, and s is the top half of the unit sphere 
x squared plus y squared plus z squared is equal to 1. Okay. Um, and the task is to evaluate the same flux integral, so the integral of f over, over this surface. Now, so if this is our situation, where s is just this top half. Okay. Um, and you can imagine that might be a bit of a pain because we have this tangent of z here. Um, over there's a rule for bad chances are you might not remember it. Um, but if we get out of doing that, that would be nice too. Um, now. Um, it seems like this makes sense to use the divergence theorem to um, try to value this integral because S only includes the top half. Um, the interior of this top half requires the base also to be included in the boundary. So if I define S1 to be the base, of this hemisphere. So this would be the set of all points. Um, so x squared plus y squared is less than or equal to 1. So everything in this unit disk and z is equal to 0. OK, so if I let S2 to be equal to my original surface S, union S1, um, then S2 is a closed surface. So I cannot apply the divergence theorem directly to S. I can apply it to S2, because now I filled in the rest of the boundary. And so my solid is everything that's in here, but it's inside this. Uh, so it's a it's the top half of the unit ball. So I can say that the flux integral or search integral over S2 of my vector field, which is equal to uh, the surface integral over the original surface S. So this is what I actually want. But I have to add on to it the integral of the same thing over the base. And that, I can say, is equal to the integral over the interior of a divergence. Okay. So this last step is by the divergence theorem. Okay. So if I focus on you know, what integral I really want, I can just solve for this. So the so my objective is a integral of f over s is going to be this integral over the interior minus the integral over the base. All right. Um, now, one thing to keep in mind, though, is for a divergence theorem to be valid, we must have a right orientation. So here we have um, my normal vector has to be pointing outward like this. Um, and therefore, from a base, my normal vector is going to be pointing straight down. Uh, because in all cases, we, for the first theorem to apply, we must use the outward normal vector. So what I'm going to do is, instead of evaluating this integral as what I really want, I'm just going to evaluate these two. Because these two, either one of these would be easier than this one. Um, and here, my normal vector is going to have zero in two of the components. It's going to point straight down. But I have to make sure that with S2, I have downward uh, 
orientation. All right. Um, any questions so far about use of divergence theorem? Okay. Um, so, if I evaluate this directly, I could try that, uh, but the normal vector n is this normal vector, and it has non-zero components in all three directions, x, y, z. This has a normal vector that um, is non-zero only in one component, so the integrand is bound to be simpler there. So first, let's deal with the integral over the interior. So we have So we need a divergence of that vector field f. So if I label these components p, q, r, so I need px plus qy plus rz. That's the divergence. Okay. So what are the partial derivatives that I need? Um, yeah, z squared plus yeah, y squared, and then r squared, just x squared. Just x squared. It's y squared has no z dependence. Okay. So, um, so now what we can do is, um, well, it's, we're integrating over top half of a sphere, so we should use what? Which coordinates? Well, the first. Spherical. Spherical. Yeah. Um, and this is rho squared. So this can be expressed as, uh, so our limits, it's the entire top half. So 0 to 2 pi in theta, 0 to 1 in rho. Uh, what about 5? What, what should the limits be on that? Just the top half. 5 or 2, because it's north pole to the equator. And it's been a while. Um, okay, rho squared from our integrand. And then we'll remember the extra factor for spherical? Sine phi. The rho d phi d theta. Okay, so now this integral will be manageable. Um, so we'd have, okay, so 0 to 2 pi of nothing d theta of 1, 0 to pi over 2 of sine phi d phi, and it goes from 0 to 1 of rho to the fourth uh, d rho. Okay. Um, so this is going to be 2 pi, um, and this is going to turn out to be just... Um, uh, one, because um, it, you'll get minus cosine evaluate the limits to get one, and this is going to be rho to the fifth over five, so you get all told two pi over five. Um, so that takes care of that piece. Any questions about this piece? What remains is the other piece. So we have um, over S2, the face. So for this, we need parametric equations for a base. Now, the normal thing that I would do is, well, first of all, z equals 0 for the base. So that helps. Um, if I just have a disk, what would I what would I normally use? What have I used before for x and y? Like my parameters are u and v again. 
Um, yeah, um, or like u sine b, u, cos, uh, u cosine b, u sine b. However, I'm going to do something unusual here. I'm going to switch them. I'm going to let x is u sine b and y is u cosine b. Um, and the reason why I'm doing that, I don't absolutely have to do this, but it's in my notes and I'm not deviate from them because I will screw it up. Um, and that is, uh, this has the effect of reversing the orientation. If I use regular coordinates, and you know, u cosine up here and u sine down here, I would get a normal vector that is pointing straight up. I want it pointing straight down. Now, I could just negate it. Um, but this is another way when you're dealing with a circle or a disk to reverse orientation. Um, and my limits is at radius 1, so u goes from 0 to 1, because that's my r. And v goes from 0 to 2 pi. So we know we're going to have an integral 0 to 2 pi in v, 0 to 1 in uh, uh, u, um, and then my vector field is, okay, so it's z squared x, but z is 0, so that helps a lot. So we have uh, 0 for a first component, and then uh, 1 third y cubed, so we have um, 1 third u cosine v cubed, um, and then for the third component, all we have is y squared, so we have um, Okay, u cosine v squared, the product with the normal vector, which we don't have yet, but we do know that the first two components are going to be zero. So this ends up not mattering. And then we still need to fill that in. And I, can, I know the first two components, components are zero because this is a flat disk situated in the xy plane, and the normal vector is going to be pointing straight down. So. Um, we compute our partial derivatives with respect to u and v. So with respect to u, we get sine v, cosine v, and 0. And then our v, we get u cosine v, u sine, minus u, sine v, and 0. So then your normal vector is their cross product. And because that z component is 0, that tells you right away your first two components are going to be zero. And what about the last component? It's worked out similar to many examples. So we cross multiply these and these and subtract. Yeah, because you get minus u sine squared minus u cosine squared. Sine squared plus cosine squared is one. So we get minus u. Okay. So that's what we fill in right here. Then we have du. I'm going to separate these. OK. So now this is our integral. Um, and what remains is to take the dot product, multiply corresponding components, and add them up. Most things will go away because of all the zeros that we have. That's nice. Um, and what you have is minus u cubed cosine squared v du dv. Is that even really good my notes? Yes, it does, shockingly. OK. Um, now, this can be separated. So you have 0 to 2 pi cosine squared v dv times 0 to 1 u cubed du. Um, and uh, okay. I don't remember how we handle cosine squared or sine squared. The, the, the general idea is the same. Let's go up a time or two. Half angle formula. So cosine squared, there's a one half, and then you have one plus cosine of two v. This integral right here is just going to turn out to be one fourth. That's quite easy to handle. And if it was sine squared, we'd have a minus right here. 
Well, it turns out the only part that ends up mattering is the 1, because the integrate cosine 2v from 0 to 2 pi, I'm just going to get 0. So we get minus, and then this integral, that turns out to be, you integrate from 0 to 2 pi, you end up getting um, v, or v over 2 from 0 to 2 pi. So you just get pi, and then 1 fourth. Um, this is on pages uh, 148 to 149 in the notes. So ultimately, we put everything together. Well, first, any questions about this integral? Um, so, um, and the thing is, you could just, if you, if you don't remember that this gets wiped out, you could always just go ahead and work it out because you get um, 1 plus cosine 2v is v from a 1 plus sine 2v over 2 with limits 0 and 2 pi. And you plug in these limits into sine 2v, it just gets 0 for both of them. So that's why you get just plain old 2 pi. But then you have a 1 half out here, and then a 1 fourth from here. That gives you pi over 4. Okay. So we got 2 pi over 5 for the first integral, minus pi over 4, so I'll box these, for the second integral. So now we can go back to our original problem. Um, so this turned out to be, okay, this was 2 pi over 5 minus a minus pi over 4. Um, so you get 8 over 20 plus 5 over 20. So you get 13 pi over 20 as your final answer. <coughs> So any questions about this one? Now, this last thing is an interesting application, and I want to see if I can squeeze into the last nine minutes. But I don't want to hear anyone packing up until eight minutes and 59 seconds. <laughs> Um, all right, so suppose that you have a vector field F that is a flow of heat energy. Okay, um, and it turns out to be equal to minus K radians of T, where T is temperature, um, K is a constant, Thermal conductivity. Um, and this is a relationship is called Fourier's law. Um, now, um, so we have our usual situation where E is a solid contained within a closed surface S, and it has an outward normal vector N. Uh, throughout, um, and we have a law of conservation of energy, which says that the rate of change with respect to time, so a partial derivative with respect to t, of the amount of heat energy inside the solid E. Um, so this is the density of heat energy. So rho is not spherical coordinates in this case. We don't even have a sphere, necessarily. All right, so law of conservation says that the time rate of change of total heat energy within the solid 
is equal to um, the flow rate or flux into into the um, into the solid. So this is flux, which refers to a flow rate. Right, so um, heat energy per unit of time into um, the solid E through S. So we have heat energy going in um, through the boundary, boundary surface S. And because it's into the solid, that's why we have to have a minus N here. Okay. <clears throat> because N is the normal vector that's pointing outward. Okay. Now, um, rho, the density of heat energy, is related to the temperature. So C is something I hadn't heard of since eighth grade science class, the specific heat. Um, and then rho is the mass density. And capital T is, again, the temperature. OK. So this allows me to rewrite the, um, this relationship as, um, OK. On the left side, I can replace rho as C rho naught T. And then the integral on the right side is F, I substitute what F is, K gradient T. And the minus here cancels with the minus down here. So what I have is k gradient of t dot normal vector ds. But now um, c is a constant. Rho naught is a constant. So I can take this time derivative and move it inside. Um, also, here, I can apply the divergence theorem to this. Um, so this is the integral also over the interior. k is a constant, so I have the divergence of the gradient. So this is just another way of writing divergence. You see in the homework, the, diver the homework you nice divergence and curl. Divergence is del dot something, and curl is del cross something, but it still means divergence and curl. So now, I have integrals on both sides over the same entity, over the solid. So what I can do is I can put everything on the one side, set it equal to zero. So I have c rho naught partial with respect to t minus k Laplacian of t, all of this, the integral is equal to zero. Laplacian of t is txx plus tyy plus tzz. Some of all those particular second partial uh, derivatives. Okay. And just refresh your memory, that is called a Laplacian of t. Almost done, I swear. Um, now, the solid E is any old solid. This applies in any solid whatsoever. The only way that this integral over an arbitrary solid can be equal to zero is if this whole thing, the integrand itself, is zero. So, so for the last concept of this whole semester, well, that's right, I could do the cake sometime. Friday, Friday will be cake. So I want you guys to come here on Friday. Okay, well, also review, but whatever. Okay, so now I can say that whole thing is zero. So I can say um, time derivative of temperature is equal to this constant, k over c rho naught, times the Laplacian of t. Um, so this is how the temperature behaves due to conservation of energy and a divergence theorem. And I should mention... That's what was used over here. 
to get from here to here. Okay. All right, you can start packing up in 30 seconds. Um, <laughs> so this is called the heat equation. And it is called a partial differential equation. Most of you have taken differential equations, 285. That was ordinary differential equation involving just plain old derivatives. A partial differential equation involves partial derivatives. That's where it gets its name. Um, for instance, in math 417, which all physics students had to take, um, they're covered there. Um, so uh, this is one of the most important partial differential equations um, in applied mathematics and I spent a fair amount of my research on. Um, so uh, this is where basically the mathematics goes from here because after having this background with partial derivatives and multiple integrals and the various vector calculus theorems involved, uh, a lot of equations like these, there's heat equation, there's wave equation, there's Plot equation, other equations that describe physical phenomena uh, that can be solved by various, in various means, but all that rests on the material covered in this class. Um, so I just want to point out, like, uh, for those of you who are you know, taking classes like this or have some flexibility, um, that this is uh, one way to go. Um, so it's really why 280 is kind of like a gateway, in a way, to real applied mathematics. Okay, so that's it's all the new material, so we have nothing to do on Wednesday or Friday, but well, homework questions if you want, and also, more important, final review. So now you can pack up and get out of here. <laughs>